In the holiday special, we saw the remaining members of the team getting ready for Christmas. Mantis and Drax decided that Peter's childhood hero, Kevin Bacon, was the best thing they could give him. The special also allowed us to learn more about Mantis and Drax. In this video, we'll discuss how MCU Phase 4 finally fixed Drax's power level and ranked the other Guardians' power levels. First off, Guardians of the Galaxy finally made Drax the Destroyer strong again. Guardians of the Galaxy was Drax's first movie in the MCU. He was introduced as a criminal who wanted to get back at Ronan the Accuser for killing his family. Because of this, he went on a killing spree across the galaxy and got the name the Destroyer. He's a Kylosian with superhuman stamina, agility, durability, and strength, the last two being his main powers. Drax's super strength has made it easy for him to break through stone and metal, rip machines in half with his bare hands, and beat many enemies. But he's tough to survive attacks that would kill any other species. But Marvel made Drax a funny character in the movie's second installment, and it stayed that way ever since. However, this made him less powerful. In one of the many after-credit scenes of Volume 2, Drax is stabbed by the Yaka arrow as Kraglin tries to get used to it. Even though it's made of Yaka metal, it shouldn't have hurt Drax as much as it did, but this fit with Drax being changed into a comedic character. The holiday special got rid of how funny and weak Drax was by showing how easily he could flip a car with his strength and how multiple gunshots couldn't hurt him. It did this without taking away from the character's comedic tone. Sure. That doesn't look like a man to you. Up next, why was he weak in the MCU? Drax was initially driven by revenge for what Ronan did to his family, but after Ronan was defeated at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy, his desire for revenge decreased significantly. This made way for comedic Drax, even though he swore revenge against Thanos, who ordered the murders that left him without a family. After that, the MCU put more effort into making Drax a likable and funny character, which worked, but made his powers less important. Marvel has found a good balance between how funny Drax is and how strong and tough he really is, and we hope this will continue in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, followed by Marvel Can't Recast Drax After Batista Leaves. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 should be Drax's last appearance in the MCU, since it's hard to imagine anyone else playing the character after Batista gave him such a unique and memorable performance. Even though Batista had been working in Hollywood for years before the first Guardians movie came out, the MCU movie really made him a big star. It's the role that many of us think of first when we think of his career. Drax is a unique character with a very specific personality. After Batista did such a great job in the role, putting anyone else in it would set them up to fail. Even James Gunn, who made the movies, agrees. We had it under control. We did not. You don't have to believe in yourself, because I believe in you. Moving on to, the MCU avoids major recasts. The other big reason not to recast Drax is that the MCU has avoided major recasts since the beginning. The last time Disney changed who played a big Marvel role was in Avengers, when Mark Ruffalo took over as Bruce Banner from Edward Norton. Even that change seemed alright though, because Norton's Incredible Hulk movie didn't do well at the box office and didn't fit in with the rest of the series. Since then, major MCU characters have either been played by their original actors or written out of the story. It'd be strange to break this pattern now, especially with a character like Drax. Drax, who's so well known. Drax wouldn't even have to die, he could just be written out of the story satisfyingly, ending his emotional arc. This is a real possibility because of how dark and sad the Guardians of the Galaxy 3 trailer is. It'd give Batista's Drax the ending he deserves and keep us from wondering who Marvel could cast as the next Drax after Batista. Now, let's look at the other Guardians' power levels. The Avengers are the most important group of heroes in the MCU, and the Guardians of the Galaxy are the second most important ones after them. One could say they have a much bigger responsibility because they have to think about Earth and and all the other planets in the galaxy. In just two movies, Guardians of the Galaxy and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, they beat some of the most dangerous enemies in the universe, like Ego the Living Planet and Ronan the Accuser. The Guardians lineup changes from movie to movie, and each member brings something different to the team, but they aren't all equally powerful. Rocket's cybernetically improved, which makes him stronger than the average raccoon, but not that much stronger than the average human. Just by looking at him, you can tell he's one of the weakest Guardians of the Galaxy. Aside from his upgrades, he doesn't have many superpowers, and most of the time, he finds with guns, but luckily for him and the Guardians, he makes up for his lack of physical strength with his intelligence. He's the ship's main engineer, not to mention Star-Lord and Gamora. In Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Peter Quill was the strongest team member at one point because he had inherited his father's heavenly powers, but when the team got rid of Ego, Quill lost his powers and returned to how he was before. He can also take hits from the Abelisk's tentacles without getting hurt. Quill didn't get hurt when the laser drill blew up during the battle on Ego's planet. When he fought Ego, he could defend himself against Ego's attacks, and at the end of the fight, he 
only had minor injuries, he could use his cosmic power to make his body stronger and more durable to the point where it was almost impossible to hurt him. This made it easy for him to break through stone and let him stay alive when he crashed into the ground at bullet speed. Even though he couldn't make things out of anything or do other godlike stuff like he used to, he wasn't a normal person either. He's still a mix of human and alien DNA, which is how he could hold on to the Power Stone in the first movie. Gamora's been called the deadliest woman in the galaxy more than once, and with good reason. Thanos taught her how to fight, and she is a very skilled fighter who has rarely met an enemy she couldn't beat. She fought Groot, Rocket, Quill, and her own sister all by herself. With her sword Godslayer, she could kill the Abelisk, a creature with many dimensions that the Sovereign had hired the team to kill. Fool. Should have learned. Let's learn more about Nebula and Mantis. In the first movie, Nebula's kind of sus because she works for her father. In the second movie, she joined Gamora on the team. Nebula's one of the Lufamoids. Thanos also trained her, but she often lost to her sister. To help her get better, Thanos replaced her limbs as a punishment. She isn't as good at fighting as her sister, but her mechanical limbs give her a healing factor that makes her much stronger and able to pop her body back into place when she gets hurt. Her upgrades also allow her to hack into technology and do things like project holographic images. She could also easily break the neck of a Chitauri soldier with one arm, even though she was weaker after being tortured for a long time by Thanos. Nebula could even slightly stun Thanos with a punch and a few hits with her baton, but Thanos quickly caught up and punched her to send her flying. Nebula can easily handle getting hurt more than once, especially if she falls from a high place. Even though Drax the Destroyer's cannon fired directly at her, twisting her body, she was otherwise unharmed, and her cybernetic implant straightened her out. Mantis isn't one of the smartest people on the team, but she's one of the strongest. But she's strong not because of how she looks, but because of what she can do. Mantis can feel and and control other people's feelings just by touching them. She could put Ego to sleep when he was in planet form and temporarily control Thanos when he had most of the Infinity Stones. Finally, Groot and Drax. Groot has the most different powers out of anyone on the team. This is because he has full control over his body and can shape it in different ways for fighting. Groot's natural abilities come from the dendronic wood that makes up his whole body. Because he was born with alien bark, he can't be hurt by most projectiles or even fire. He can use psychokinesis to control all plant life, absorbing it into his body to strengthen himself. And if that isn't the coolest power, then we don't know what is. He's also very tough and strong. Even when he was a baby, he was able to fight people who were much bigger than him. Not only that, but he he can heal himself, so even if he's badly hurt, he will get better and be fine in the end. This Guardian's a tough opponent for any supervillain who threatens the universe. This is because he has super strength and knows how to do quasi-dimensional engineering. Don't be fooled by his slow walk. Actually, he's one of the smartest Guardians. At the end of Avengers Endgame, Thor got on the ship of the Guardians, making him part of the team. Thor was strong enough to face the full power of a star, beat the Hulk many times, and fight Thanos himself. We don't know if this membership will be permanent since the Guardians are in Thor Love and Thunder, but that doesn't change the fact that he's the strongest team member, maybe even stronger than Quill. And on that note, that's a wrap for this video. What do you think of Drax the Destroyer finally being seen as a powerful guardian? Which guardian has the highest power levels? Let us know in the comments below. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. See you at the next one.